On this podcast, you'll find interviews with high-performing, successful individuals in life sciences. On a weekly basis, we cover their proven methods, principles, strategies, and mindsets to implement new technologies that scale to meet the needs of people in our world. Welcome to the Life Science Success Podcast. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Don. I'm a consultant in life sciences. I help companies manage complexity and increase performance. Before we hop into today's interview, I just wanted to mention real briefly, I still have my organizational maturity assessment live on my website. For those of you who would be interested in going through an assessment to try and see how scalable your organization is. And so I would encourage you to visit the 5280lsc.com website, 5280 Life Sciences website, and go through the organizational maturity assessment. So with that, I wanted to bring in my guest, Chris Anderson. Chris is a seasoned pharmaceutical professional with more than 20 years of experience in multiple fields within the industry. And so with that, welcome, Chris. Thanks, Tom. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for being here. So would you just mind taking a moment to introduce yourself to everybody? Yeah, absolutely. And and before I do that, I just, uh, I, I mentioned a little bit before, but really appreciate the the service that you're doing for the, the, the life science community. It's really impressive to see just the wide array of people that come on your podcast. So really appreciate it. I really appreciate that as well. And since you mentioned it, I just, I wanted to just take a quick moment as well so on LinkedIn, I've put out on a daily basis, there's an announcement that's going out for anybody that's going to bio. There's another opportunity for people to be interviewed on the podcast. I'll be at bio and, uh, you know, thought that I would take the opportunity there as well. But today is all about you. And so, um, you know, please share a little bit about yourself. Yeah, sure. So uh, I, uh, I am originally from Chicago. Uh, and uh, grew up there. And while I was growing up, I, I uh, wasn't really sure what I wanted to do with my life, probably like most people. And, and um, I, I had visions of being a doctor someday and just crazy things. So long story short is I ended up going to pharmacy school. So I'm a pharmacist by trade. Uh, I kind of joke around. I can count by fives really fast and tens, depending on the day I can do it pretty quickly. So, um, so I, I worked in, in retail after graduating for a, a few months and, and while I was in school, um, short story is, is that I, I had the ability to go out and do some internships at kind of a manufacturing kind of the industry. And so I was like, oh, wow, I could do something as a pharmacist out of the industry didn't even know that was possible. And so I worked in retail after graduating, but kind of had the knack to come back into industry. And so uh, kind of made that jump and uh, really have been in the industry ever since. So I've been, now I'm actually going on year 23 now. Yeah, year 23. And I've kind of jumped around uh, kind of various, uh, various disciplines from quality to regulatory to tech services, techs, you know, kind of, kind of manufacturing production and kind of all things in between. And so I think if you would have asked me 20 years ago when I was a pharmacist, uh, or 23 years ago when I was a pharmacist, that I would still be in the industry, I would have told you you're crazy. So um, yeah, it's been quite a journey to say the least. Yeah, and so um, what made you pursue even being a pharmacist? What, what sort of interested you in getting into this space in the first place? Yeah, it's uh, as crazy as it sounds, it was actually a suggestion from a college professor. Um, so um, I had originally planned to kind of go into biology and she kind of pulled me aside when I was in kind of freshman courses, kind of undecided. She said, hey, Chris, you know, you kind of have a really kind of have a, a, a little bit of a different personality. I think you really should look into going to pharmacy. You can help people. You can really get involved in science and you know it's it's it, there's a need at the time there was a really drastic need for pharmacists it was it was kind of a short uh we're short-handed out in, in the, the retail world and so i kind of looked into it looked into it some more kind of saw the coursework and i thought wow this really aligns with kind of my initial thoughts and um decided okay i'll make the jump and uh, i i did not regret it uh kind of once once i got into it for sure yeah and then, I, I mean, it's interesting to me always to sort of hear like the the career transition, right? So you go from 
pharmacy to quality. You said that you had done a few different things in between. Um, you know, to me, and this is just my perception of quality inside of, you know, most, most pharmaceutical companies, it's, it's extremely detailed. Um, you have a lot that you have to sort of watch on the periphery that could get you in trouble. And so you just got to make sure that, you know, sort of things are staying in, in line as well. Um, so what is the day in, in life like for you as the senior director of quality at Myosite? Yeah, so it's 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 interesting. So if you were to ask me pre- previous to to myocyte, I was kind of in more larger uh, pharma, if if I would say, and um, it's different than it's different from larger pharma to kind of small biotech kind of startup type thing. So for me, kind of in 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 the kind of the biotech space, it's a little bit of everything. Uh, you're firefighting to some days. You know, if there's a, a an issue that you have to kind of deal with, kind of on a daily basis. There is, as the product and the life cycle starts to kind of push itself out, you're starting to now kind of plan to do some strategic planning and kind of looking out around the horizon of, you know, what, are, what resources do we need? What uh, systems maybe do we need? Or what do we need to modify to, to kind of make sure that we're, we're staying compliant with kind of, you know, ongoing regulations? So it's a little bit of a hodgepodge of everything because we're such a small company you have to kind of dive in. So sometimes, Don, I'm, 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 I literally on my desk here. I'm, I'm writing documents. I'm typing documents. And on the other yeah. cases, you know, I'm, I'm putting together PowerPoint presentations or whatever the case may be. So it's, it's really all things in between. And I think that's just the life of of most uh, smaller companies, right? I mean, I um, I've lived a bit of that life myself, and and so you know, I, I tell you know, everybody, you know, look from you know one minute you could be you know, having to do janitorial services. And then the next minute you're doing an executive presentation. It just depends on sort of the size of the company and whatever your, whatever the needs are at that point in time. Um, yeah. But yeah. Yeah. And, and it's weird too, because, uh, or not weird, but it's, it's different too, because, you know, to your point about quality, you, you do have to kind of have a wide scope. You know, if, if it was just, Hey, we could focus in on manufacturing, that would be great. But you kind of have to have knowledge about a little bit of everything, you know, at least at least knowledge enough to understand, do you have risk there? Do you have a problem there? Or are you pretty good? You know, are you best in class there? Um, so, yeah, it, it just kind of depends on on what it is. I think long term, though, you know, it's kind of scaling up and kind of getting ready for that kind of, you know, hopefully launching of a product and commercially what it looks like. So. Yeah, so it's a good lead in. Uh, so who is Cook Myocyte and, uh, you know, what is what are your products? Yeah, so we are kind of a, right now we're in a phase three, uh, kind of, I don't want to say late stage, but we're in phase three clinical trials for um, what we call our, our AMDC product. So it's autologous muscle cell um, products. And, and basically at its core, what, what we do and, and what our mission is, is we're, we're trying to make um, regenerative medicine, kind of a part of everyday medicine. And again, kind of going back, if you would have asked me in pharmacy school, if that was a mission statement, I would have said you're crazy. You know, it was like regenerative medicine, what's that? So, you know, when you, when you kind of look at it, that's what, what our goal is. What we do is we actually take um, a biopsy from a patient in an outpatient clinic, clinical setting. Uh, we take that sample, bring it in house um, from a, uh, their leg, basically. Uh, it's a biopsy. It's muscle cells that we're looking to get into. So we take that biopsy, a muscle cell biopsy, we bring it in-house. We actually break the cells down to their myocytes. So if anybody ever wonders why myocyte, the individual muscle cell is myocyte. So we break it down to our individual muscle cells, we grow them, and then we kind of ship them back to the patient. Um, and we inject them, hopefully, where we can re- regenerate and rebuild muscle cell where, where a patient has lost function. Uh, so it's really unique. It, it definitely was something that I was not super familiar with coming from large trauma, you know, um, from, from typical cell therapy. But um, we are kind of researching right now three primary indications. One is our, our stress. We call it stress urinary incontinence. So kind of a fun fact or, or maybe not so fun fact is that um, female patients uh, around the world, probably around 60% or so deal with some sort of urinary incontinence issue. And so um, when you really look at it, there's not a lot out there to, to kind of help treat them. And this is an area where you can actually use your muscle cells to regenerate and rebuild. 
um, some function uh, around their, their, you know, kind of their, their urinary uh, function. So along the same lines, we're looking at fecal incontinence. So same idea, uh, mm. just with, with fecal incontinence. And then we recently started to research uh, a little bit more in depth, uh, what we call tongue dysphagia. So it, cancer patients that maybe have had a loss of their tongue function or have parts of their, their tongue that have been cut out and they've, they've really struggled to kind of, um, you know, keep whatever function they have. It's, it's, it's a really debilitating uh, disease. It's, it's something that, I, again, uh, it's, it, if you look into it, it's really kind of, kind of sad. Um, so this actually has the capability, or hopefully, we're hoping it has the capability of regaining uh, some of their ability to chew food, swallow food, wow. all things in between. This is, that's amazing. Yeah. And, and um, you know, for sure, I, I, you know, I'm very familiar with uh, the, you know, female incontinence as well as, you know, even the fecal incontinence as well. So, yeah, I mean, very, um, very interesting uses for, um, for the drug. Um, I, one of the other things I want to go back to though, in terms of your career. So you, um, you've held a lot of different roles, you know, from training, it looked like to, to quality, um, you know, what sort of interested you, you know, more on the quality side, uh, you know, to, to pursue this as, as a profession? Yeah. It, it, so when I first kind of came in, kind of, kind of green, um, I, you know, I, again, kind of being a retail pharmacist, I knew, okay, hey, there's these drugs, you know, sometimes tablets, capsules, sometimes injections, you know, kind of depending on, on what it was. So when I got into the industry, I, I, I like to use the term, I didn't know what I didn't know. And so as I kind of started on my career trajectory, I, I, was, I, I was like immersed in kind of, wow, there are so many things out there that I did not realize that went into actually making this. And so early on, I had made the decision I'm going to try to learn as much about the industry and how this stuff actually gets to the market, you know, whether it's a tablet or a capsule or whether it's, uh, in this case, regenerative medicine. Um, I, I just said, I'm going to jump around. I'm going to learn stuff. So kind of fast forward. Um, I, I kind of, I kind of just migrated to the quality group because that function really gets their hands on almost everything, you know, so if you kind of, kind of jump, you know, if you kind of make that leap of logic, I come in, I want to learn a lot about medicine. Okay, great. How it's brought to the market, the, how we make it. Okay. Now fast forward 20 years, I want to be in a position where I can kind of touch that same kind of breadth of, 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 uh, of knowledge. And so quality kind of gave me that opportunity and, and, um, that's really what kind of led me there. Other, other aspect is, you know, there's a kind of a pharmacist link there too, you know, so I got to see how those patients uh, would, would, you know, how they would, lives would potentially improve, you know, whether it's an antibiotic, you know, or, or something else, I kind of saw a patient improvement and I said, okay, I want to make sure that what those patients are getting, they can really rely on, you know, and, and, and that's another aspect of it as well. Yeah. Yeah. I just feel like there's, to me, there are a lot of there are a lot of very tangible items on the quality side um, that you can put your hands on. I've worked on, I, I mean, I I essentially manage quality for General Electric for a number of years. Um, yeah. You know, on the implementation side, and so you know, I said I, I ran U.S. quality, and one of the you know quality leaders that I had as a mentor, thankfully, you know, was a, just a great individual. It helped me through. You know, essentially FDA audits and things like that to try and yeah. make sure that we were always we were always prepared and we always knew exactly how to how to manage things. But I also knew very tangibly where the organization was. And then if I go to like the adult learning side, there's so many. It's it's a great you know place to dedicate you know your life to, and I love you know sort of teaching as well. But yep. um, there are a lot of intangibles on the adult learning side where you you're essentially you put out the material and then you just don't know what people are going to you know pick up and absorb either. So you know I kind of look at the at the two as you know being like in you know tangible and intangible you know kind of worlds that you were having to live in you know and that's that was a reason for the question because it's you know it's definitely a journey from one to the other. I as I look at it. Yeah, and and you know when you looked at. Part of being a pharmacist, obviously, you know, if, if you just looked at it as a core, um, 
you know, when you come in to maybe get a new medication or something like that, you, you know, you get it. Part of our job is to train, you know, hey, take this once, twice a day, whatever it is. Um, and then as we kind of progress, even teaching the patient a little bit more about what it actually does, you know, I, I think that's even become even more relevant uh, as, as we progress in, in the industry. But yeah, I, I, I so, you know, as, as I was kind of involved in training and learning and development and, and how that correlates to the breadth of things that you touch within quality, I mean, I listen, I learn every day, but being able to kind of take that and then teach around it, you know, and try to make sure people know, hey, this is why we're doing what we're doing. Um, it seems so simple, but in so many cases, there, I, I've encountered so many situations where it's like, wow, I didn't even know that, you know, like, this is why we're, we're doing something this way, you know, or, uh, to make it more compliant, sure, but there's actually some teaching here of why it may even impact the patient while they're doing it, you know. So, yeah, there's there's so many linkages to training and quality and 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 uh, kind of my background just kind of led to it. Yeah, very good. So, in your professional career, what are some of the biggest challenges that you faced? Yeah, I, I think especially in in my current position, it's it it's the newness of regenerative medicine, and I think probably other other folks that have been on your podcast have kind of said similar things. It, it's it's so new. It's such a such a a, a uh, different type of of medication, a different product, a different way of doing things. That it, it it's a challenge to even kind of figure out how to navigate certain areas because there's not a lot of guidance. There's not many companies out there that are, are doing a lot of this. For some of the some of the stuff that that has gotten out there and got approved, okay, it's it's out there. But for us, it's it's kind of a brand new world. You know, there's not a ton of, of companies that have got our type of, of uh, product out to the marketplace. And so, trying to figure out, you know, something simple like, um, hey, how do we how do we make sure that that we ship this thing and make sure it gets right to the patient at the clinic? You know, just something similar that making sure that it stays within, you know, certain temperature or certain things like that seems pretty simple, but it's not nearly as simple as, as what people would think it might be. So I think the biggest challenges that, that I have here is, has been just the newness of what we're doing. And then as we progress, hey, are we staying compliant? Are we staying, are we doing our checks? Are we doing our, our you know, our, our proper um, things that we need to do to make sure the product is safe and effective for the patient. So I think that's one big thing. And, and, and really this, the evolvement, the evolving industry as a whole, I think is an overall challenge. You know, it's, it's, it's changed to where trying to explain what we do and, and, and having, you know, the FDA understand it or having, you know, other companies understand it, whatever the case may be, you know, there's a learning curve even there. So just, just the, the I just leave it at that. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, there's so much, so much that happens in our industry that, that, I mean, it, I've said it in other episodes as well, that, I mean, the science is um, just absolutely blows me away oftentimes in terms yeah. of some of the things that we do and um, you know, just watching, you know, essentially people, you know, scientists will stand up and say, well, we're going to do this. And they make it sound almost like, you know, hey, this is this is natural for, yeah. For, yeah. for things to happen. And yet, you know, that there's an audience that's out there. I mean, it's one of the reasons why I'm thankful for the podcast as well, that you, I know that there's an audience that's out there that needs to sort of, you know, understand it, at it, understand things at a deeper level as well. And so, um, you know, thank you for for explaining the challenge. Cause I, I agree with you. It, it's oftentimes a challenge that I think many face, you know, in, in our industry. Yeah. And, and if you spend the quality kind of the quality aspect on it, you know, it's, there are times where it's, it's challenging to kind of figure out, okay, Hey, is, is, is what we're doing compliant? You know, there's, again, there's not, it sounds maybe, maybe so simple, like, Oh yeah, it should be black and white. And, but it's such a new area that, it, it, it challenges you on that end, even, you know, just kind of from that day to day. So, um, yeah, it's, it's definitely something that it's challenging, but it's also fun because you're learning as you go. Absolutely. 
And what are some of the biggest opportunities that you see for the future? So I, I think the, the biggest opportunities that, that I see, and I'll, maybe I'll, I'll, Don, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll give you two answers. But one, one is, I, I think there is a huge opportunity for companies that are kind of getting into cellular therapy and, and gene therapy to really partner with the, the government, partner with um, other businesses, partner with entities that are larger to really figure out where the needs are. You know, there's, mm-hmm. there's, there's so many unmet needs out there that the, it, it, it's hard to imagine, but, you know, tablets and capsules, you know, they didn't, they didn't really have a whole heck of a lot to give you as a patient. Well, now we're getting into kind of regenerative medicine, personalized medicine, you know, and, and so being able to work with different components of, of the, the life science, um, groups and the government entities that are associated with it, I think is, is a really unique time to do it, you know, because it's so, it, again, it is so, so new. I think from the quality perspective, I think one of the biggest challenges is, is to make sure that we're, 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 we're moving forward, but also making sure that, that, you know, we have, we, we're making those, those checks and balances. We're making sure that they're there. Um, because you can get into purely, you know, scientific mode and, and it makes sense. Like, Hey, I'm going to go from A to B makes sense to me, but is it compliant? You know, Mm -hmm. and and that's a, that's a, that's a different conversation sometimes. So I I think there's a really just a vast area where, and you're starting to see papers and, and different groups starting to kind of talk about it and build processes around it and offer those types of things out there. It's a really, really, really unique area where I think people can really get involved, especially in cell and gene therapy arena. Yeah. Yeah. If I, I mean, I, I guess I would go back to a couple of things that you said, right? I mean, in terms of the unmet need, we definitely are, are in a very tough situation right now with the funding uh, for a lot of companies. I mean, you know, trying to make their way through. I mean, I know of, you know, a couple of really breakthrough technologies that are coming that, um, you know, frankly, the CEOs are just fighting to try and get initial funding, you know, to be able to carry the, the research forward. And, um, you know, those challenges are, are, are only going to compound here in the short term as well. I mean, I don't see I, there were people that were telling me, you know, hey, look, June, July of this year, we're going to start to see a different wave. But that <laughs> that Silicon Valley Bank, you know, sort of yeah. challenge that we just went through you know, sort of froze everybody in, in place for a moment. So they're kind of hanging on to their cash as well. Um, yeah. So, yeah. And you had mentioned challenges earlier. Yeah. If you look at the macro challenges, kind of just from the industry, I mean, I know it sounds really crazy, but you're, we're still even dealing with a little bit of, of kind of the COVID hangover, I'll call it, you know, where, where we're, I, I, I know you probably know this. It, it's, it, we struggle sometimes to find people, you know, mm-hmm. to, to help it because yeah i mean it's just it's it's tough to even get certain individuals kind of involved with it so when you look at from that perspective even okay you know resources can become an issue on top of money and and so yeah there's a lot of those macro headwinds that i think can even add to your day-to-day challenges that you probably have right and then the i mean in terms of partnering the consortium ed- episodes from last week um I, I felt like the the two episodes from last week more or less tied together in terms of consortia and um you know what's interesting to me is i feel like those are are opportunities again to try and get the academic institutions to partner with industry as well and um you know so i, I mean i feel like there are opportunities out there but again it's it's sort of at what level, right? Because I mean, that would play through on the on the scientific level. But again, if you're in a quality function or in an operations function, you're probably not getting served at that same level either. And so there's sure. there's opportunities again to partner even broader. So yeah, yeah, it, and it's it's one of those areas. Like I said, it, it it's so new. It's it's like I said, when you do kind of kind of the old school, what you would think of as traditional industry. Okay, yeah, there's there's stuff out there that's not a not a problem, but boy, there's a whole new wave of us that are out there that it's like, wow, you know, we, what are you doing? Well, what are you doing? You know, and and you almost organically find out, but yeah, it's definitely an area where it's un, unserved, if that makes sense. Absolutely. 
So, Chris, there are three questions that I like to ask every guest. What inspires you? Yeah, I, I think for me, um, what inspires me, and I see it here at, at Myosite every day, is just the, the, the people and the, the, just the, the ideas that people bring. Um, it, it's really inspiring to come in and, and to even talk about certain things that we're doing here and at other places. Uh, it's, it's, it's just, it kind of, it kind of takes your breath away a little bit when you sit back and you actually really think about it. You know, we, we kind of get, we lose, uh, the focus on it sometimes, but it's like, wow, you know, if you would have told me that 20 years ago, I would have told you you were crazy. We're, we're, we're curing cancers. We're, we're, you know, fulfilling, uh, 60% of, of women that, that have stress urinary incontinence, you know? I would have never in a million years thought that it was there, but some of the people and their ingenious ideas, their inventive ideas, it inspires me every day because the future is, is, is really bright. Thank you for sharing that. What concerns you? I, I think the biggest thing that, that concerns me is, is, is that the, the hurdles that we face to try to get some of these things to the patients, it, it, because there, there's not, maybe the the best guidelines or there's or there's there's not a lot of uh kind of guide rails even to, to kind of push along those processes can kind of delay getting some of that stuff to the patient and so you want to do it safely you want to do it effectively of course uh, from from that perspective that, that goes without question but this the the speed at which you have to do that you know are, are we are we able to to get those unmet needs at at to where it matters, you know, mm. to where it really matters to the patient. And I think that's, that's the thing that concerns me the, the most. Yeah. And then what excites you? Uh, no doubt what excites me is the future. Uh, it, 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 there is, there's so many things out there that can really have an impactful um, part of their life. I mean, just from a medication perspective, but even if you think about things like AI and some of these other things that are kind of going into different areas, um, it, it's so exciting because it's so new and there's so much, like I said, there's so many unmet needs there that uh, the, the sky's the limit, you know? And so when you look at it, even from the quality lens, um, there's so much work to do and, and so much uh, just kind of things to kind of break down and, and mark down and figure out how we do this and how we navigate this and set up certain areas and guidelines and all this other kind of things that just maybe come naturally to people that have been in the industry for such a long period of time. But it's really exciting to be a part of the, at the ground level uh, and try to build those things up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. And thank you, Chris Anderson, for being here and telling us about Cook Myosite and um, all the great things that you're doing. Thanks a lot for, for being on the Life Science Success Podcast. I appreciate you being here. Thanks, Don. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you for listening to Life Science Success. For complete details about this podcast, including show notes, how to get in touch with guests, and more episodes, please visit www.lifesciencesuccess.com. If there's someone you'd like for us to invite to the show as a guest, please let me know by sending me a message at the podcast website. Please click subscribe on your favorite podcast app, share the podcast, or tell a friend about it. And last but not least, rate the podcast. Thank you again. Thank you again.